As we prepare for this message today, I'd like um, each of you just uh, to pray for God's Spirit as you hear this message to shape the things that God wants you to hear from this message and be challenged by the things that God wants you to be challenged by in this message. So just take some stillness and let the Spirit speak to you. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I hope you're excited that we're back in the Sermon on the Mount again. We started with uh, the Beatitudes that kind of lay the foundation of the vision for this new kingdom that Jesus is talking about that has come in His presence on this earth. From there, we live into some of the ethics of the kingdom, some of the old ways that you have heard it said, and some of the vision of what this kingdom looks like as we live in this world together. Matthew 6 was the spiritual disciplines. Jesus talked about prayer, almsgiving, fasting, how we go deeper in this kingdom. And today we shift to our relationships with each other in this kingdom. It's an invitation for us to understand how we, as the body of Christ, function together. So Matthew 7, words that are familiar to you, as Jesus says this, Do not judge, that you may not be judged. For with the judgment that you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. And do not throw your pearls before swine. Or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Why are you doing this? Somebody asked me this week. Why talk about a hot-button topic like homosexuality? Believe me, this week I've asked myself that many times. And, um, and part of what we learned last week on the Ritter Retreat is part of integrity is giving your word to something and then doing it in a manner and a timeliness that it was meant to be done. So I don't know how many of you were here in June when the Supreme Court, I believe on Friday, made a decision about gay marriage. But on that day, I gave my word to something. I said, I will talk about this. I'm not going to talk about this today, but we will talk about this as a church. Because people were coming in and and grabbing me by the arm and saying, Taylor, what are you going to say about this today? Our country is going to hell. What are we doing? What are you going to say? And other people came in and grabbed me by the other arm. That was the right arm. Some people grabbed me by the left arm and said, what are you going to say about this today? This is a day of great rejoicing. A relative, a friend, somebody I know is is celebrating today that they can get married. So I gave my word (laughs) that day that I would talk about this. And today is that day. I told Bruce, you know, when we talked about the baptism, I said, hey, I'm preaching on homosexuality that day. It's going to be a fun day to be in church. And um, 
when we planned this in September, we kind of charted out the whole year and we said as Matthew 7 comes and, and the church is talking about how it deals with each other, this is a good day to talk about these hot button topics. So we're going to spend two weeks on homosexuality and we'll tie this in with Wednesdays at the Well. We'll talk about the biblical text this Wednesday. You're going to have some questions from today, I'm sure, and we can talk about those things. Next week, we bring in somebody who is a follower of Christ who's gay to share his perspective on what that's been like for his life. And then finally, we have um, our classes delegate to what's called the Jerusalem Council, which is going to be meeting this Friday in Chicago. And let me explain that, because when I said I would preach about this, I had no idea that this would be the week the Jerusalem Council would be meeting, and that our General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America has asked us to spend 21 days in prayer and fasting over this issue, because I don't know, but it could be that we won't have a denomination by the time the June rolls around. I mean, that's, that's what some people are saying. This is such a divisive topic. Um, so we do need to be praying and we knew, need to be taking some time to fast from something just to focus, focus on how we might be praying for the Reformed Church in America, a church that I was raised in. I love. My family's been a part of this church for generations. My wife's family's been a part of this church for generations. And we don't know. It's, it may be coming apart at the seams. Uh, but the Jerusalem Council, if you don't know where that term comes from, in Acts 15... Uh, the church was being torn apart by this idea that uh, Gentile Christians who were not Jews that were coming into the church, uh, the, the Hebraic Christians said they have to become Jews. They have to live by the law of Moses to be saved in, in the grace of Jesus Christ. So that's the way it's got to be reflected. With circumcision, with the laws, with everything. And so Peter and Paul and the apostles gathered a council to talk about this. And they came to the position that said Gentiles could come into the church of Jesus Christ without all the mandates of the Jewish law, but are received into the community in the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the Jerusalem Council from Acts 15. It's interesting that they've used those words for this group that's meeting this week. Um, also, I didn't know that... Uh, the Pope would make his proclamation on the joy of love and say the church needs to open up to gays, divorced, those families of different, different, uh, different makeups. I said in my touche, you think God planned all these things for Hopewell Reformed Church? You know, and said, well, Hopewell's going to talk about it that week. Why don't we have the Jerusalem Council? Why don't we have the Pope say something? Why don't we put it all together for Hopewell? Well, I gave my word to it a while ago, and that's what we said we'd do. So today we're looking at Scripture. What Scripture teaches about homosexuality, and we're going to start with Matthew 7. And some people have said, well, what does that have to do with homosexuality? Well, I think if you look at all of Scripture, that's what guides us into the grace of understanding the Word of God for our lives. So if you listen today to Matthew 7, you heard those words that the Pope actually used when he talked about gay relationships, right? And you've heard it, I'm sure, many times. Judge not, lest you be judged, right? Okay, so, so we can settle the issue right there, right? Okay, stop judging. It's not your business to judge somebody else. So back off, right? For with the judgment you make, that's the judgment you will receive. So if you take biblical inter interpretation, tie this to homosexuality, you say don't judge, right? Bless you, keep you, the Lord make His face to shine. We're done. We're done, right? Any problems with that? Oh, well, you could have a problem if you kept reading because the next phrase is, is something that's very popular too. I've brought a very good log in today, right? 
I kind of think it gets the point home. You know, Jesus is using hyperbolic language to say, you've got a log in your own eye and you're going to try to get the speck out of your neighbor's eye? That's not only hypocritical, it's dangerous. Were you a little worried when I was reaching for Benjamin with that log in my own eye? Hey, you're like, get out of my face! You're scaring me! You have no right to be doing that. But that's not where Jesus ends, is it? He says, first, take the log out of your own eye, and then you can help your neighbor with the speck that's in their eye. So Jesus is saying there's a place where we are accountable to each other. We are, we are helping each other on the journey of faith. But it needs to start not from your own perfection. That's not what Jesus is saying. Don't start from your own place of perfectness. Um, nothing that Jesus would be saying would be that. But make sure that you recognize in humility your own sin and brokenness before you start talking to somebody else about their sin and brokenness. Right? Okay, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make His faith. Go, go now. You're done, right? You're done? You're done? Oh no. I wish we were done. But then He says, don't give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine. The pearl, you know from other stories that Jesus shares, is, a, is an allusion to the Gospel. You know? And, and, and the holiness, commentators say, is, is that, that holiness of the Gospel that, that you've been given that is sacred, special, and beautiful as in the pearl of great price. So don't give that to dogs and don't throw that before swine. And in some of the hardest, harshest context, I hear people talk this way. That when we talk about homosexuality, some people think of dogs and swine. That's repulsive. How can we in any way be advocating that, supporting that, or, or letting somebody live into that? So, there are some that take this text and say, see, there, we're not going to give what is holy to those we consider dogs or swine. Or if you want to go to the other side of the equation too, I've heard plenty of people that say the Gospel of God's grace is too beautiful to hand it off to bigots and homophobes and those who respond so judgmentally. The ones who destroy the Gospel are the ones who hypocritically set up barriers. So don't give the beauty of God's grace there. I, am, I, am I connecting with anything here? Do you know what I'm talking about on both sides of those things? I mean, I, I would guess that somewhere in those three pictures of Scripture you would find yourself. Am I right? I'm not going to judge. It's not my place. Or let me make sure I do all the work I need to do first before I help another. Or let's not give what is holy to dogs. This whole discussion about homosexuality just is going in the wrong direction. So I think when we come to Scripture and we want to get our knockdown, lockdown positions firm, we find ourselves in difficult positions. So today as we talk about Scripture, I go back to a story from, from over 30 years ago when I was in seminary. And I had to take the two Reformed Church theological position papers on homosexuality and I needed to report on them to our ethics class, Enningerberg's ethics class. And we had to have a partner to do this, so I was assigned Neil Ohms, a guy who'd come from South Dakota, studying to be a minister, uh, very conservative in his biblical interpretation, I already knew that. And the first day he met with me, he said, I know what the Bible has to say very clearly. The Bible says what to do with homosexuals, you kill them. Yeah, I kind of laughed. Like somebody laughed, that uncomfortable laugh. But I don't know that Neil was kidding. And, and Neil was going from Leviticus 18 or Leviticus 20. 
that if a man should lie with another man, it is an abomination and they should be stoned. Now, Neil didn't happen to mention that the same judgment is applied for those who don't honor the Sabbath. I'm going out to the soccer fields today. Or also for those who disobey their parents. Jordan? How are you doing on that one? Okay. Uh, Mama's behind her shaking her head. Okay. But Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 says this is an abomination. And, And Neil took that and said, okay, the Bible's clear on that. Well, at the same time, I took those papers and I sent them to my sister's church in Boston. I knew that my sister's church in Boston had a a vibrant ministry with gay people in Boston. So I wanted to get their read on what these papers said. What I didn't know was that one of the ministers there was a lesbian woman who read the papers and gave her report back to me. And what I remember specifically was Romans 1, which was one of the most... um, challenging text in Scripture that says men gave up natural relations with women and lusted after other men. And it's one of the only places that talks about women. It is the only place that talks about women. It says women gave up natural relationships and went in unnatural relationships. Okay, those, those two things are said there. Now what this woman wrote me and what this woman said was the sin that Paul is talking about there is giving up your natural inclinations. Paul wouldn't have understood what what we may know about same-sex orientation in these days. So what Paul is saying is that it's a sin to go in a different direction than, than your natural inclinations are there. So therefore, if I should try to have a relationship with a man, I am in sin. Okay, I'm not saying today that you need to accept her interpretation, but what I am saying today is there's some challenges here. If we just say, what does the Bible say about this? How do we understand this? And here's here's what I want us to think about as we come to biblical interpretation. That what we're talking about here is people that follow the same Lord, that people that read the same book and come to some radically different conclusions. So the question that we have is how do we deal with this as the people of God? How do we deal with this as Matthew 7 invites us to deal with one another on issues that are tough to deal with? I've got to add an addendum to this because Neil Ohms is one of the names that I saw on the Jerusalem Council list. One of the 70 that are gathering there. And that sent a chill down my spine. Now, I don't know if Neil has changed since 30 years ago when we wrote that paper, but I think you understand what we're dealing with, because there's other people on the Jerusalem Council list, not the woman from Boston, but there's other people that would, that would be from that position or have that perspective there. And so these folks are going to spend five days together. They're going to spend five days together, and their charge is to come up with a constitutional solution to this issue that's been dividing us. So what does that mean? That means and this won't happen until General Synod in June, and I know you probably never thought much about General Synod or the structures of the Reformed Church, but in June there's a potential that if this council goes one way and I should marry same-sex couples, I could be brought up on charges and lose my ordination. That's constitutional. That's, That's the difference here. The other side of that is constitutionally, Um, I could marry a same-sex couple and constitutionally it could say nobody can bring a charge against me for doing that. You understand what I'm talking about? Understand 
what's at stake. So, so that's what could happen. That's what the Presbyterians have done. They've made it constitutional. And part of the reason that church is, is being torn apart is, is because of that. So there's six texts. I don't know if you know this or not. But there's six texts in the Bible. In all of Scripture, there's six texts that talks about homosexuality. Jesus, you probably know, never mentions it. Um, the first text, the one where we actually get a name that's associated with it is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19. Sodom and Gomorrah and people have always seen sodomy as homosexuality and, and condemned in, in Scripture. But actually, Sodom and Gomorrah is a story that the rest of the Bible makes it a little easier on that because Sodom and Gomorrah is interpreted by Ezekiel as a city that refused to care for the poor, to welcome the stranger, and, and lived in a way that was inconsistent with, with God's plan, God designed for them. So, so the sin of Sodom is, is much more than just defining it as homosexuality. Biblical commentators would, would take this and, and claim that because certainly the Bible comment, commentates on, on that text itself. And even Jesus, when he's sending out his disciples and he says, you know, for anybody that doesn't receive you with hospitality, shake the dust off your feet and leave, it will have been better for Sodom in that day than for that, that city. So Jesus is saying, if they are unwilling to show favor to you, recognize that God's judgment will be upon them. Jesus is not tying that together with, with sexually inappropriate relationships that the disciples may have when they go out uh, in this ministry. The two from Leviticus, as I said, the abomination, which um, some people will say abomination is tied with eating shellfish and mixing Mixing cloth together as well, that word is used throughout Leviticus in the holiness code. And that, that tries to let these people live in a way that's nomadic, in a way that they can, can function well in that society. But, but it's so much more than simply the sexuality that's there between the two. So there's, there's three. And, and I'm going to really tell you a story because I don't want to stand up here and do the biblical exegesis on all these texts, but Matthew Vines... Uh, God and the gay Christian, is um, a guy who came out of a conservative Christian background, was headed to Harvard, and uh, in his high school years came out as gay. And he knew his church has said, as in 1 Timothy and 1 Corinthians, you have no part in the kingdom of heaven if you are gay. And he knew what it, Romans said. And so he took a year off of Harvard, and he said, I'm going to spend a time looking into the biblical witness on this. And because I don't have that much time, this is the thing that takes a lot of time. Comes Wednesday night, we can talk about this more. Um, Vines goes through the New Testament and the Old Testament. And, and, and he says this, he said, When investigated Romans 1, 26-27, the central text in the debate, while Paul took a negative view of same-sex behavior in the passage, the language and logic of his discussion differ significantly from the issues of gay Christians. Paul viewed same-sex relations as stemming from excessive sexual desire and lust, not as a loving expression of a sexual orientation. Furthermore, his use of the terms natural and unnatural reflects a concern about the customary gender roles in a patriarchal society, not the anatomical sameness of same-sex partners. Finally, we looked at the disputed text, Greek text, in terms as appear in 1 Corinthians 6.9 and 1 Timothy 1.10. These two words, malakoi and arnakoi, could encompass forms of same-sex behavior. The behavior they might describe bears little resemblance to the modern relationships of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Christians. Here's where it concludes. The bottom line is this. The Bible doesn't directly address the issue of same-sex orientation or the expression of that orientation. While its six references to same-sex behavior are negative, the concept of same-sex behavior in the Bible is sexual excess, not sexual orientation. What's more, the main reason that non-affirming Christians believe the Bible statement should apply to all same-sex relationships, men and women, anatomically complement complementary, is not mentioned in any of the texts. That's a quick way to sum up 
his view on scriptural interpretation with that. Here's what I want to say today. I'm not saying this morning you go, okay, Matthew Vines is right. I change my view. I see it in a different way. The invitation that I give you today, the invitation that I give you today is to hear his story as a person of faith, as someone who's been baptized into Christ Jesus, trying to make sense of this in his life. What does it mean for him to celebrate Jesus as Lord and also live into the way that he feels that he's been created? Do you hear me on that? Do you hear me on that? You know, because we come from our positions and we start with our positions and it's very hard to hear a position that's different than that. Right here is a book, because you may be saying, okay, Taylor, but this was about same-sex marriage, which is radically different than that. And um, this is a good friend of mine, Jim Brownson, and he's written a book called Bible, Gender, and Sexuality, Reframing the Church's Debate on Same-Sex Relationships. John Young works with Jim on the Theological Commission of the Reformed Church in America. Let me just lay a little bit of his story before you so you understand. Jim Brownson's father and my father were very good friends. Bill Bronson is known as an evangelical blue blood in the Reformed Church in America. He was the radio preacher of Words of Hope, which Kathy's uncle now leads and preaches as the main preacher of Words of Hope. So Bill and his son Jim, who became a New Testament scholar and taught at Western Seminary, always had a very traditional Orthodox position on homosexuality until you know what? His son came out as gay. I worked with Jim and an ethicist and our general secretary on a group that met together for two years in 2010 and 2011. And what happened was the General Synod of the Reformed Church, you heard General Synod today more than you've ever heard it before, right? said we're in full communion with the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the Presbyterian Church USA, and the United Church of Christ. Three communions that all had decided to ordain gay pastors at a local level and also open the church up to same-sex relationships. So our General Synod said, why in the world are we fellowshipping with churches like that? We need to cut off our ties. So instead of cutting off our ties, we came together as a group to seek to understand how we discern using Scripture and making moral decisions. The Reformed Church in America was the conservative end of the group. Jim Brownson was there with me. And um, one of the first days, somebody from the United Church of Christ said, well, experience trumps Scripture. All right? So you have a certain view on homosexual relationships and then you know somebody who's gay, it changes your view on homosexual understandings from Scripture. Right? You understand that? And, and so the UCC had always said, experience is at the same level as Scripture. Well, the Reformed Church folks that were there said, no way. We can't do that. We can't say that. A tradition of Scripture alone, Scripture forms the foundation for everything. So Scripture trumps experience. Right? And so our contingent of people were, were talking about it from that perspective. And when I met with Jim afterwards, I said, Jim, just a second here. If somebody in that room or if somebody from General Synod heard you talking in there, they would say that your experience with your son trumps Scripture. Wouldn't you say that? That, that from, from moving from a traditional orthodox position, Jim had changed because of experience, because of his relationship. And you know what he said to me? He said, no. He said, what my son's homosexuality did was it drove me deeper into Scripture. And I saw things that I'd never seen before in my studies. And so when he talks about same-sex relationships, he's talking about God's design that a man should not be alone and God's design that 
We are made to be in community, monogamous, lifelong relationships, and that opened him up to a way of interpreting all of Scripture's understanding on this and seeing a different outcome than he had before. Again, again, don't hear me saying today you have to adopt Jim's views. But again, I know Jim. I know his Lord and Savior, and I know the book that he loves and he reads. I'm willing to listen to what he has to say in trying to understand a very, very difficult situation. So today, my hope for this church, and I don't know what will happen after today. I don't know what you're hearing, and I don't know what the Holy Spirit is guiding you to. But we're going to talk next week about relationships, and you may think I've already hit on that quite a bit already, but there's some stories that, that we need to share from, from our own church that I think will help us in this, and, and quite frankly, to share the story of this guy who's going to come to this church, I think is important. But my hope is for this church to be a place that has a wide tent, and we've been that. We've been that through the years. We haven't been a church looking to cut each other off if we don't agree or don't understand. And as, as I said, that day in June when the Supreme Court made a decision, I knew that we have both perspectives in this congregation. I don't know what will happen with the Reformed Church in America, but I pray that what happens here is that we can grow together in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, deal with hot-button topics like this, and live into what we talk about when we say one of our core values is radical welcome. Just what does that mean? I mean, we've never fleshed that out, and one of the reasons people have asked me, why are you talking about this? Do we have a membership issue? Do we have a leadership issue? Do we have something that we're confronting? And quite frankly, I'd rather wait to confront it until we did have a pastoral issue to, to address, but, but wiser leaders than I in the church say, no, that's going to put somebody up in a very, very difficult position. The third book, the third story that I'd like to just share with you is a letter to my congregation. This is written by Ken Wilson, a vineyard pastor in Ann Arbor that took this issue on as he had relationships with gay people in his church, as he tried to lead his church in what's called a third way. A third way, reflecting on Romans when some would eat meat and some wouldn't eat meat. There's disputable matters in the church. Trying to hold a church together where some say very clearly, this is my interpretation of, of what Scripture says, and others that say, this is my interpretation of what Scripture says. How do we live together? I mean, the church had to do that with women's ordination, right? There are some churches that don't ordain women elders, don't have women in the pulpit and say that won't happen. For a long time in the Reformed Church in America, we had a conscience clause that said if you are opposed to women being ordained or if you're opposed to women in leadership, you are not forced to participate in an ordination in that way. You don't have to do that. That conscience clause was removed two years ago. Some people in the church were quite upset about that. Others celebrated that. But the church dealt with those issues in the 60s and 70s, whether God's ministry and God's Spirit was poured out on all flesh and how we live into that. I mean, in the 50s, it was whether divorced people could be leaders in the church, whether divorced people could receive communion in the church. And, and the church had to work through that. In the 1800s, three denominations split, north and south, over the issue of slavery. The Presbyterian Church, Southern Presbyterian, Northern Presbyterian, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist, the American Baptist, split over that. Some of those divisions have come back together. I pray for this church that we are able to talk about this first, united in the one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's interesting. I, I could be brought up on charges today. Did you know that? Because constitutionally, I have broken our Constitution 
today, and if a pastor in the Reformed Church wanted to say, you baptized without somebody being an active member of the congregation. You know, but we know this family. We're in relationship with this family. We're joined in mission together with this family. And our board of elders said, we want to be a place that practices grace. And we trust the grace and goodness of God in this situation. I mean, it may be in six months, there's other reasons to be brought up on charges. But I pray for this congregation that we are always that church that recognizes not what divides us, but recognize what unites us. And that's why Galatians 3, when it talks about there's no longer slave nor free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, for we are all one in Christ, brought together as the family of God in baptism. So whether you were baptized in a Roman Catholic church, whether you were baptized in a Baptist church, whether you were baptized in a covenantal church, I pray that that's the founding place of our identity. Not am I gay, straight. Not am I liberal, conservative. Not am I this or that. But recognize that our identity comes from being baptized in Christ. And that's my prayer, Matt, for your son. That Benjamin, all his life, will know first and foremost who he is by his baptism. For he has been called into the family of God through one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all and in all and through all. Amen? (laughs) Lord, this is tough stuff. And we pray that we recognize first and foremost that the only thing that makes us clean is the grace of Jesus Christ in our life and open ourselves up to that this day. And I pray for this church, Lord. This church, Hopewell Reformed Church, but the Reformed Church in America, the church of Jesus Christ around the world, that right now this is a divisive topic, especially here in the United States. I recognize that that it's, it's a battle that's being fought more here than other places in your church. But we pray, Lord, for your vision of understanding what, us, what unites us together in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.